Well, blessed Sabbath, everyone. It's good to be back in Benton on a late summer's day. And uh, we are eager to enter into the seventh month of the year, the biblical calendar, which is a month by which God is pouring out more of his spirit than any other time in all the year. And I don't know about you, but uh, I want to be filled. And I want to have more of that sanctifying presence of God and more of that assurance of His unconditional love and for His grace. And so we will be gathering in uh, a few weeks' time, October 1st to the 8th. And we have a venue down in North Georgia. And so for those who are interested here or online, we have information, we have flyer, uh, and we can get that to you. So just reach out to us. And... Um, I will also be speaking again here in Benton next Sabbath as well. Uh, so it will be a, a double blessing this month because normally I, I speak typically once a month here. So we're gonna, um, I'm going to begin with prayer and then we're going to get into this study. And it's going to be a study on studying the Bible. And we're specifically going to look at understanding of the Bible as it relates to understanding God. Understanding who He is, what He's like, and how do we look at the entire Bible, not just certain verses here or there that support what I want the Bible to say. No, we want all of the evidence. So will you join me in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the Sabbath. We thank you for the freedom that you give us. We thank you for your unfailing love. And I pray that as we open up your word, that you would guide us and lead us into all truth. Lead us to your son. And your son uh, is drawing us ultimately back to you. And this is a beautiful pattern of you as the great source of all and your son is the great channel of all. And we are all patterned, all of your creation. You've written this pattern of father and son into everything. And I pray now for your spirit. I pray for our hearts and minds and our ears to be opened and for your angels to be present with us now. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So there's a phrase that is often put before me and those of us who have an understanding of God as just like his son. And the phrase often goes, Take the Bible as it reads. And it's typically levied toward us as a criticism, as though our understanding of what the Bible is saying is out of context. But I don't actually see it as a criticism at all. I say to that wholehearted, amen, to take the Bible as it reads, the whole Bible. Hey, good morning, Beth. So... How, how do we do this? Hey, Steve. How do we take the Bible as it reads? What does 2 Timothy 2.15 say unto us? Let's turn there. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So studying is an essential part of our Christian experience. When we first get started in our experience, and I I can say that about myself, it, for me, it tended to be more of a, experience based on feelings, you know, getting this feeling of excitement, feeling of, you know, this, what the Spirit of God is speaking to me in this moment, and I feel this, and this music makes me feel this way, and having an experience that is predicated upon feeling some something, some powerful sign. And if we rely on that only, we're going to be in error. Because the experience of Jesus shows us that he had many occasions, his entire experience on earth, 
um, for the most part, except for times when he was with Lazarus, his friend, and the disciples, when, and, and people like Mary Magdalene, who, who understood what he was going through. Other than those experiences, it was full of a lot of negative emotions of being attacked, of being maligned, of being accused, of being persecuted, and being plotted against to kill him. And so if he based his entire experience upon feeling, like what, what hope would he have and what hope would we have? It wasn't on feeling at all. It was in faith, the faith that he had in his father and in the promises of the Torah, of the Old Testament, right? His father's word. And so we have to go beyond our feelings. And this is not to say that reason and faith are completely, they're not antagonistic. It's not oppositional, where these things are against one another. There's a right relationship. We should have an experience founded upon an intelligence, as we, said, as we see here, a study of the Bible prayerfully, and then that will be confirmed through emotion, like positive, joyful emotions about the truth as to who God is, and that Jesus has come to show us Him who is true, His Father. And when we see these things and the promises that He will comfort us, that God is the source of all comfort, and we can go on and on and on, that should elicit joy, and that we have assurance of forgiveness of our sins, because God loves us, right? And which is why Jesus came to show us that, that we're forgiven. So those things should elicit joy and emotion, but if we relegate or discard our responsibility to study the Word of God, why? Why should we study this? Well, it teaches us who God is, right? And it teaches us our need of God and who we are. And so if we throw that away, then our experience is going to lead into um, error. And that error isn't just... Uh, Oh, you're wrong. It can have eternal consequences, as we know. And it can lead us to ultimately reflect a character that is completely contrary to who God is. All right, let's look at just, just a couple more on this. Um, I don't have this one in front of me. Let me just look this one up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Amen. His word is life-giving. His word is life-giving. Yes. So we have that hope. And no matter where we fall or where we fail, we have that hope. You know, and that's what his word gives. For me, because I fall and, you know, it gives me hope. Oh, Amen. Absolutely. That he will never leave us nor forsake us. Yeah. That his, his love isn't dependent upon our performance. Because we've all, as it says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as Paul says in Romans. Okay, one more verse on the subject of taking the whole Bible as it reads. Let's look at, uh, this time, 2 Timothy 3. So just go to the next chapter, if you had your Bible open. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture. Even the scriptures that maybe we don't want to see, that are inconvenient, that convict us, that make us rethink how we operate, or how we view God, or how we view one another, and people that are maybe using us or abusing us, or slandering us, or attacking us. How do, we, how do we treat them? So we need to look at all of these verses. We can't, take, we can't ignore any of it. Okay. So how ultimately do we know whether something should be taken in the Bible literally or figuratively? Do we just decide that something's literal or symbolic based upon a whim on my feelings? Like, oh, I want this, this verse to be symbolic now because that's going to support you know, my belief. Or, you know, or I want it to be literal. Is, is, that, is that how we go about our study of the Bible? If, that, if that's how we do it, then 
we're not going to arrive at the truth. We're not going to know who God is. We're going to ultimately um, be living in a way that is completely out of harmony with him. If we do it in sincerity, again, God can work with us, but he's wanting us, as we have opportunity, to really know who he is. Okay. So this attitude of, oh, I just decide whether something is literal or figurative based upon what I want, what I think, about my experience, my ideas, this is kind of like the fertilizer of what has uh, lended itself to 40,000 denominations, Christian denominations. 40,000. That's staggering. All based upon different notions as to what the Bible is telling us. Or, in a lot of those notions, pretty much end in, I like this part of the Bible, but I don't necessarily like that part of the Bible. I want to use the clear text to explain the unclear text. But is that, again, taking everything as inspired and taking the whole Bible as it reads, letting the Bible explain itself? So there are those who currently right now are attacking us for believing that God is just like his son, as I said. And what do I mean by that? Uh, that he's completely nonviolent, that he doesn't use force, and therefore to not use force is also not to kill. Uh, and I have a question for those who are attacking me over that belief, or others. Uh, are you looking at all the evidence in the Bible? Are you taking the whole Bible as it reads? And is it possible, are you over-literalizing -literal certain verses uh, to fit your own ideas? And maybe even you're unaware that you're ignoring all the evidence because it might show something different than what you believe. Is that, is that possible? And some could say that with what we're about to look at in the beginning, that I'm casting doubt on the Word of God, that you're undermining my confidence in that the Word of God says what it says. Uh, and for some, that remark or that criticism, it's sincere, but it's, it's ignorant. Uh, and for others, that excuse, um, it could be an excuse just to not to let go of false ideas about God. An excuse that uh, if I believe what you're saying, that means I have to treat people differently. That means I have to not condemn this person uh, or wish that in this, this person, in my heart, that this person should die, this person should suffer, or that, just wait, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God is going to take vengeance on them. Uh, and this might even, not even be something that we're aware of. It could be subconscious, you know, deep within us. And so let's ask the question on that. It, is, it, is it wrong to want somebody like Hitler uh, or Stalin? What about Jeffrey Epstein? the guy that has kind of organized the whole pedophilia racket that a lot of high-level politicians and elite business people and corporate executives have participated in, or others, like maybe a father, a mother, a brother, or a sister who has verbally, emotionally, or physically abused us, uh, or sexually abused us, or ultimately, is it wrong to want Satan and all these people I mentioned before to, to be destroyed or to be burned alive either for eternity or for a period of time? Is that, is that wrong? Well, what does Jesus show us? Where does Jesus give us any example of wanting your enemies to suffer? He does the exact opposite. He rebukes his disciples when they say, Jesus, Elijah called fire down from heaven. The Samaritans just rejected us. You should bring fire down. Burn them alive. How does Jesus respond? He rebukes them. He rebukes them. And what about vengeance? Again, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. As it says in Romans 12, 19. What is God's vengeance? You can say, okay, Ben. Yep, you know what? The Bible doesn't give me personally any authority to uh, destroy my enemies, to kill my enemies, to fight, to use a sword or weapon. Uh, but, but God is going to do that. He is going to in the end. Okay, well, what is God's vengeance? And I'm not going to do an exhaustive study, but let's just look at one verse. Let's go to Psalms, Psalms 916. You 
And we'll look at one more verse after that as well. Okay, Psalms 9.16 says, The Lord is known by the judgment which he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. doesn't say the wicked is snared in the work of God's hands, his own hands. His, that is his judgment and his justice. If I were to just take this one verse and build a whole understanding of how God, what his justice is like, his judgment is his vengeance, and ignore all the rest, that would be the very thing that I'm talking about and encouraging us not to do. And we don't have time to go into many verses that show this. And ultimately, what, is, what does Jesus show us, right? What, what did justice look like for Jesus and vengeance look like for Jesus? Because he had many opportunities to destroy his enemies, and yet he never did it. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. Okay, one more verse on trying to get a, a bit of a picture of vengeance and of justice. Psalms 34, 21. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. Evil, not God. So my appeal before I go any further and look at some verses that could appear at first to somehow place doubt on the word of God or undermine our faith my, here's my appeal. It is Proverbs 18, verse 13. Proverbs 18, 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Apply that to the thought level as well. If you hear this, if we're hearing it now, for those who are here or for those who might listen to this recording online, as you're hearing what I'm about to share, these verses, if you start in your mind drawing conclusions before you've heard the totality of this and before you've gone further then to look at all the evidence, you're cursing yourself. We can't allow our emotions and our feelings uh, to color our interpretation of the Word of God or to cause us to make conclusions before we've looked at everything. So, okay. With all of that as a disclaimer, let's, let's get into it. So how do we understand these verses? Are these, are these what I'm about to share? Are these literal or is this metaphorical? Is it a figure of speech? Is it an expression? And then ultimately, how, how do we know? All right, so let's look first at John 12. Let's go in the New Testament. John 12, 39 and 40. Okay. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes and understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. Okay, so John is talking here about a prophecy from Isaiah that was predicting that those in Israel, the Jews, there would be some whose hearts would be hardened, whose eyes would be darkened, who wouldn't hear the truth, and that they wouldn't ultimately be converted. They wouldn't see Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God. So we take that as it reads, only, and we take a, a hyper-literalized approach. What's our conclusion? God violated their free will, and intentionally hardened their hearts and blinded them so that they couldn't be saved. That's troubling, right? Okay, let's keep going. Is that the only example? All right, let's look at Isaiah 13, verses 16 through 18. Isaiah 13, 16 through 18. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them, which shall not regard silver, 
and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. Yes, if we take that literally, that means God is responsible for inciting genocide in the Persians and the Medes against the Babylonians. Because it's saying they didn't care, they weren't trying to conquer Babylon for gold or silver, for riches, for property, possessions. It was just vengeance. They complete and utter hatred to the point of where they wanted to genocide and annihilate them and do abominable things. It says here that apparently that God did it. All right, we're going to look at a couple more. And again, hang on. I'm not saying that we shouldn't believe the Bible here. We need to understand, how do we understand this? Are these passages to be taken literally, hyper-literally, or are they figurative? Are these expressions, and how do we know these types of things? So we have to ask, okay? Let's look at... Mm, we'll do a couple more. Um, Second Samuel. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 11 through 12. Okay, and this right now is a prophecy through the prophet Nathan. This is after King David committed adultery. Okay, God sends a prophet to him and tells him about the consequences. David confessed his sin. He cried out to God. He asked for forgiveness and he was forgiven. There are consequences that happen. And what is this? And what is this telling us? If we take this literally, what would this tell us about God? So 2 Samuel 12, 11 and 12. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And I will, give, I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou did it in secret, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the Son. Okay, so if we take that literally, what's our conclusion? God impressed Absalom with these perverted and wicked thoughts. Basically, like incestual thoughts uh, and adultery. I mean, there's, there's so much that's wrong with that polygamy, all these things. That, that, that means that God is responsible for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Is that, is that really what God's like? And how do we know? We need to take the whole Bible as it reads. Okay, let's look at, we'll just look at one more example. Um, let's look at uh, Samson. Here's another one on this, on this similar, similar vein. So it's Judges 14. Go to Judges chapter 14, verses 2 through 4. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all thy people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So did God place that desire in Samson's heart rather than to find a woman who was of, of, of faith and a worship of the true God in Israel, rather than find her for a wife, that he would go and find a Philistine who rejected the true God in order for God to take vengeance upon them? That would be highly problematic. So how, how do we understand these things, guys? And we can look at, I'm not going to go into these, but we've, we've heard these subjects. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Did God harden his heart and prevent him from letting God's people go so that God could smash them and destroy them, inflict plague, plagues upon them because he had an anger problem? Is that it? Or did Pharaoh harden his own heart? 
And we have, again, we could, maybe I should look at, look at one of these. This would be a good example. Uh, let's look at King David again. And let's go to 2 Samuel 24. So 2 Samuel 24, verse 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. And do you guys know what res the result of that was? By David numbering the men of arms? Yeah, absolutely. Plagues came, and many people here eight. This, let's see, do I have the verse right there? Mm. Pestilence, I'm in verse 15. It just says, So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time of the appointment. And there died of the people of Dan, even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. How do we understand that? It says that God moved upon David to do this, and then God turns around and punishes the people for David's sin. We see how this would be problematic if we took these verses literally. So how do we understand these things? Look at 1 Chronicles. The same, so we're going to look at the same subject we just looked at here. And we're going to try to identify who is the one who tempted David. 1 Chronicles 21.1. 1 Chronicles 21.1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Okay, so it was Satan who did it. So why, though, did we read there in 2 Samuel, why did it say that God moved upon David? We have a number of examples like this, where in one place in the Bible, it's written as though God is directly doing it, but in another place, it's actually, in this particular case, it's Satan who tempted David. When we think of the, the spies that were sent out to spy out the land, in one place it says that God told Moses to spy out the land. In another place it said, Moses said that the people came to me and I thought it was a good idea. So why do we have these things? Are, are, these, are these contradictions? I would say they're not contradictions. They're there to help us to take the whole Bible as it reads, as we're about to do. Because we know as far as tempting people, in James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15, it tells us what God's role or his involvement is with temptation. It says this, James 1, 13 to 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God's not doing that. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. God's not bringing forth death. Sin is bringing that forth. God is not tempting us. He didn't tempt David then in turn to go and punish the people of Israel because of David's sin. We, there must be a different way to understand this. Okay. We also have expressions like this where, where it appears as though God is actively doing it. As we've looked at these examples, he's merely permitting it. So this is an example of what God is declaring or what God is permitting is written as though he allowed. Another classic example, we won't look at this, is Saul, when Saul died in battle in one place, in the same exact chapter, it says that God killed Saul. But if you look at a few verses earlier, it said that Saul killed himself. He fell on his own sword. He committed suicide. And so this is exemplified in, our, in, in English today, and I, I would posit probably in all languages, in, in, in an expression like this. If I were to tell you guys that Marie and I are building our own house, are we literally just the two of us building our own house? Or have we paid somebody else to build it? How would you know? You need context, right? 
Or what about President Biden's economic policy, Bidenomics? Is he the one that has drafted this entire policy to govern the nation regarding how to stimulate the economy? Did he do all that on his own? Or because he is the highest authority in the land in the United States government, he's seen as responsible. It has his name on it, right? Okay, so how do we know then whether God's directly doing something or whether he's merely permitting it? I would say to you, go to the life of Jesus on earth. His life on earth is the ultimate rule of Bible interpretation, the life of Yeshua. That unlocks everything for us. And I'm not going to go into all of the verses that show that, but we are going to look at some of them. And I want to take us first to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll look at verses 13 and 14. Second Corinthians 3, 13, 14. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away with in Christ. And we've had all kinds of different interpretations throughout Christianity as to what does that mean. We said, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus came and he did away with the law. It's done, it was bondage. So that's one way, yeah, he did away with the Old Testament. And that bondage, the veil is taken away, it's passed away, it's abolished. Or is it possible that by him coming, he's abolished a perverted understanding of the law of God. That he's abolished this idea of a legalistic relationship to God in that God is requiring me to keep the law. And then he'll save me. And then he'll listen to me. And then he'll hear me. I need to take things into my own hands. Is it possible that those things are abolished? That this wrong conception of God, and in turn, if we, if we have our idea and picture of God wrong, we're gonna, totally going to misunderstand his law. Is that abolished? And so these things being done away with in Christ, what does that mean? So there's a veil when we look at the Old Testament, as it says, but these, that veil is now removed in Christ. You can say, again, yes, amen, he just did away with it all. Or we say, if we look at his life, and his life recorded in the gospel accounts, the veil on what God was trying to communicate to us through his prophets, through his spirit in the Old Testament, and that's removed. It becomes clear. Jesus is, again, that ultimate rule for right Bible interpretation. His life. Not just, oh yeah, Jesus did away with it, or Jesus' name. No, how he lived. Which, well, how do we understand the Old Testament then? It requires a prayerful study of his life. How did he relate with the disciples? How did he relate with the leaders of Israel? How did he relate with the poor people, the outcasts, the fatherless, the widows, the, the children? How did he relate with the people that the Jews thought weren't even worth their time? You know, the Samaritans and others, you know, the unclean heathen and the pagans. How did Jesus treat them? Verse 16, Dell says as well, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Hallelujah. Amen. When we turn to Yeshua. Okay. Let's look at... There's a couple of passages we could look at. We're going to conclude here in just a moment. Let's go to 1 John... Chapter 5. Let's look at that one. The Epistles of John, the first epistle, chapter 5. Verse 
I want to start in verse 5, and then we're going to jump all the way to the last verse. This is, this is talking, this is showing what we just discovered, that by the Spirit of the Lord, the veil is taken away as we look at the life of Jesus. And so this is showing again that it all comes down to knowing who God is through his Son. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So there's something about believing that Jesus literally came from his Father, that he's not a metaphorical Son, and that God, who is a Father, is also not a metaphorical Father. There's something about that that is, there's a, that's the key, in other words, to overcoming the world, to overcoming sin, to overcoming unbelief and unrighteousness, and will also rightly help us to divide the Word of God and to interpret it. Okay, so now let's turn to 20. So second to last verse, 1 John chapter 5. Okay, and we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. Why did he come? It says it right there. That we would know him that is true. That we would know the God of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, that we would know the Father of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came. And it goes on. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. And then this. This is the true God and eternal life. To know who God is. And we can't do it without Yeshua without Jesus. And if we look at his life and we see that he rebuked his disciples when they tried to commit acts of violence, like Peter taking his sword out, cutting the ear off one of the soldiers, Jesus heals him. And we see how he treated them when they wanted fire to come down from heaven. And we see what he counsels them to do, resist not evil, right? You've heard it said an eye for an eye, or that you should punish if somebody sins Against you, you should punish them with an equal exercise of force. If they steal from you, steal back from them. He said, you've heard all those things, but I say unto you, resist not evil. Why? Because he says, be ye merciful as my Father in heaven is merciful. He causes it to rain on the just and the unjust alike. He's not a respecter of persons. Jesus came to show us that his Father is not like us and how we're prejudiced, racist, sexist, selfish. You go on and on and on. That's not what God's like at all. He came to show us that God has forgiven us of our sins. And not only has he forgiven us, but that he, he'll cleanse us. That's why he came to show us. And he, he didn't come for any other reason. It was in the process of showing us, perfectly revealing that love, and Jane smiling, she's got something to say, hold on, almost there. In, in revealing that love, nowhere did he say that he came uh, to administer God's justice by you know, threatening us through you know, his eternal hell, burning hell, or through any other means of violence. Not at all, he did the exact opposite. Yeah, Jane. Open it, he will come in 100%. Amen. Oh, nothing of us, all of him. Oh, Amen. And notice how, notice how you, he knocks on our door. He doesn't take a battering ram and slam the door of our heart open. No, it's a still, God speaks in a still, small voice. He will not violate our freedom. So it's a, it's a, a, it's a unique way to think of God's justice as giving us complete 100% freedom. And then whatever needs to be done to change us to be like him, he will start doing it if we want it. That's, that's the key, it. if we want it. With our whole hearts and mind and soul, then he does it. We just open the door, and he comes in and does it. Mm. It's incredible. Amen. And He's the ultimate gentleman. 
Yes, Amen. absolutely. So bringing it back to these, oh, Steve, go ahead. Amen. It's our foundation for. What's the reference? It's First uh, Corinthians three, ten and eleven. And so our foundation for it to be sure, for us to overcome the world, for that veil to be taken away, with it needs to be built upon Jesus Christ, upon the Son of God, and in His life. Did you have your hand up, Donnie? Yeah. Okay. Let me just finish this thought, and then you. So in His life. Where do we see him doing any of the things that we read in the Old Testament where it appears as though God is responsible, has incited, has inspired these people into these uh, acts of, you know, almost atrocities and genocides and, uh, and adultery and on and on. We don't see that in the life of Jesus anywhere. He is the way by which we know if God is directly doing something or merely permitting it. The veil is done away with in Jesus. I was going, going to go back to this we can answer later on, maybe another sermon. Okay. But we're talking about David, the sense that he took, and yeah. Satan made him do it. But when it went back to Samuel, second Samuel twenty four, and verse ten it says David's heart is condemned. Mm. Right? Yes. But um, but then it says uh, God gave him three Three options. One was to, let me see here, um, seven years of famine, or David could flee or be chased for twelve for three months, or a plague. Mm. But David chose the plague, and seventy thousand men were got the plague. Mm. So. I mean, if you're looking at it, if God gave him these three options, mm -hmm. would it have been better for David to have picked, you know, hey, let's, it's my, it's my, it's my, it was my decision, sin. my sin. I need to be running for my life, but he chose 70,000 men to get killed. Mm -hmm. And if I was one of those 70,000 men, I'd be begging and pleading David to choose to be chased for three months. Because mm -hmm. I don't want, and my family don't want to die. Yeah. So how do you explain that? You know, so that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. And so that's not, that's it's a deeper. There's more going on there, but I'm just saying that. Absolutely. God very clearly says you have three options. Mm. Mm. So it, it gives it, it's it's fascinating there that God gives us freedom of choice, and there are consequences that because of David's decision, you know, to succumb to the temptation of Satan, to rather than trust in God, trust in the might, the strength of Israel through numbers, through military might. And so by succumbing to that, there's a train of consequences that God would not stop because it would be a violation of that complete and absolute free will. So God's justice is being seen there, and he shows David, here are things that could happen. And that is interesting, that David has a choice, David chooses this one, but then, yeah, why? Why all these people that... Yeah, absolutely. Yep, and I would, I would say as to the nuance and the detail, that's a really good question. I would say that as to whether God is directly afflicting David with any of those things, do we see Jesus do any of that? And so God is merely telling him, here is the result, here is the train of circumstances that can play out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, just speaking for myself, I'll say it that way. Speaking from my experience, when we pick something, when we choose something, we 
God gives us the right to do that. We don't often think about the consequences thereof, that who else it may affect. Yeah. Yeah, why did yeah, why did David choose that that of those three options? So good question. Okay. Well let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we can rightly divide your word through the life of your son, through Yeshua. The veil is removed. And it's through a right understanding of his identity as your son that he is the chief cornerstone. He is the rock upon, uh, Father, which your movement, that your church is built. And it's his life that shows us clearly, more clearly than anything else, who you are and what you're like. And I thank you that your son didn't condemn anyone. And he told us you don't condemn anyone. That your son didn't kill anyone on earth. So therefore, I believe that you didn't kill anyone. And that he didn't do any acts of violence against his fellow man. Uh, and I just ask that you would give us that spirit. The spirit uh, of confidence in you as Jesus had. The spirit of abiding trust that though the world should forsake us, you won't, Father that we can call upon you and that you will answer us and show us great and mighty things which we know not. Amen. And so we do pray for the Spirit of your Son to come into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Forgive us of our wrong understandings of you. I pray that this message can be an appeal to all of us, beginning with myself, Father, uh, to ask you to help us to understand your word, uh, to use the freedom, to use this mind that you've given us to search for you with all of our hearts. And then your word tells us in Jeremiah that we will find you. And we thank you that you are the pearl of great price. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.